The year is 980 AD. As one of the Viscounts, you must keep the balance between your loyalty to the king and gaining the favor from the people. Do you want to learn how to play Viscounts of the West Kingdom? In this video, we're going to take you through the full rules for this game. Coming up. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Ipu University. Now let's get to the rules for Viscounts of the West Kingdom, game by Shem Phillips and SJ McDonald and published by Garfield Games. We are using a prototype copy of the game, and so the rules and components you see here may not be final. Let's get to the table. In Viscounts of the West Kingdom, players play as competing Viscounts going through the kingdom and attempting to solidify their position as the hold of the king over the kingdom weakens. Players will seek to gain favour with the king and with the people through the construction of buildings, by sending workers to the castle, by transcribing manuscripts, acquiring and approving deeds, and more. Players begin the game with a small band of townspeople and will recruit more from the board as the game goes on. The timing of the game is controlled by players acquiring debts or gaining deeds, and when players have either driven the kingdom into poverty or into prosperity, the game will end and the player with the most points wins. I won't take you through the full steps of setup, but I'll describe some of the key things that you'll see when you're done. The main board is compiled from five separate sections and they're put in a random order, but make sure you use the side corresponding to your play account. The castle is placed in the middle of the board. Each section will have a random stack of townsperson cards and a random stack of manuscripts with one of the cheaper starting manuscripts on top. Lay out a number of pairs of a starting resource card and a starting hero card equal to the number of players plus one. Choose a first player and then in reverse turn order, players will draft one pair each which will determine their starting materials for the game. Each player then takes a player board, nine buildings which are placed in these spaces along the top, corruption and virtue markers which are placed at either end of this track, a deck of eight matching coloured starter cards into which the drafted hero is shuffled before being placed into the draw pile here. 20 workers, and any goods, silver, debts or deeds printed on the player's starting card. The player's Viscount token is placed on the main board in the space matching this number on the starting card. Each player then draws three cards as a starting hand. Finally, and after giving out starting debt and deed cards, count out a number of debts and a number of deeds corresponding to your player count from these tables. Place the counted cards on top of the dividing card and any leftovers beneath. Debts should be placed negative two points side up and deeds on one point side up. These two stacks will serve as the timing mechanic for the game, triggering the end. You're now ready to play. Viscounts of the West Kingdom is a game with a lot of moving parts. However, there's ultimately only four main actions that players will be taking on each turn. The key to playing the game is understanding how to go through the full sequence of a turn, represented in this line, to get to those four main actions. So first we'll take you through this turn sequence in high level before we go into each step in detail. First you will adjust your three card tableau, discarding the last card, sliding the other two across and then choosing a card to play from your hand. Some cards have abilities that will activate at this point during the round. Next, you move your Viscount a number of spaces clockwise around the paths on the main board equal to this number on the card you played this turn, although you can pay silver to move further. Next, you take an action at the location where your Viscount finishes. There are four main actions you can choose from, trade, construct building, place workers, or transcribe a manuscript. At this point, you will accumulate action points to take the one action you've chosen. Each of the four actions is associated with an icon and the matching colored resource. And you gain action points by looking for that icon in your three card tableau, in any other bonuses you've built on your player board, 
by spending the corresponding resource, and even by paying the townsperson on the wedge where your Viscount is located to gain their icons for this turn. Then spend those action points on the action you've chosen. Then, if you have enough silver, you may choose to hire the townsperson in your current location, building up the strength of your deck. Then you resolve your corruption and virtue track, and finally, you draw back up to your hand limit. As you can see, there is a major part of the strategy in this game involved in most efficiently using your tableau and building a strong deck which suits your strategy, and getting your Viscount to the right place at the right time to do the actions. The game is timed by the collection of deed and debt cards, and one of the major ways players will gain this is through the corruption and virtue track. We'll see more of how this plays later, but essentially, if players take a corrupt path, they will have an easier way to get their actions, but they'll take a lot of debts, which can be worth negative points. If they take the virtuous path, they can gain deeds, which can be turned into positive points. However, players will also need to keep an eye on what their opponents are doing, because all players interact on this track. Now, we will step through the sequence of a turn, step by step. The first step in each turn is to adjust your tableau. You'll start your turn with three cards, and the first thing you do is discard the card in the rightmost slot. If that card has a drop-off action, which is signified by this X, then at this point you resolve that action. Here with Therese, you would gain two virtue, and then get to discard a card of your choice from your hand. Next. Slide the remaining two cards one step to the right, and then choose any one card from your hand to place into the leftmost slot of your tableau. If the card has an immediate effect signified by this lightning bolt, then immediately resolve that. Here, the player would gain one debt card for that antagonist. Any effect showing this icon is an ongoing effect which will be in play as long as that card is in the tableau. Thirdly, check for criminals. Criminals are represented by these purple skulls, and they are a wild icon for the purposes of doing your actions. However, since they come from criminal activity, you will take corruption for using them. When doing this step, if the card you played has any skulls on it, then immediately gain one corruption for all skulls in your tableau. Here, the player would gain three corruption. Then proceed to the move step. To do the movement step, check the number in the silver icon in the top left of the card that was just played. You must move clockwise around the board, along the paths in the direction of the arrows, exactly as many spaces as that number. You may then pay silver back to the supply to move an additional space as many times as you wish. However, you may never move fewer spaces than the number printed on the card. You may share a space with another Viscount, but when you do this, the other player or players may rearrange the cards presently in their tableau, a good way of bringing drop-off effects closer to the end or optimising the tableau. The player may move through an opponent without conceding this benefit. Next, the player chooses an action and gathers action points for it. There are four actions available. Trading and building can only be done when the player's Viscount is on the outer edge of the board. Placing workers and transcribing manuscripts may only be done from the inner ring of the board. Let's say the player has chosen to place workers. The icon associated with this action is the fleur de lis, and the resource is gold. The player then accumulates action points as follows. First, count any matching icons in the player's tableau. So here there is one. Skulls are wild, so also count any skulls, another one. If the player has constructed the building that reveals that icon, then this counts as a permanent icon, so here's another one. As we'll see later, players can also get a permanent icon from a cleric bonus card from the manuscripts action. Some cards with an ongoing effect allow players to buy certain icons, so here the player could spend two silver to gain another. Then, the player may gain a one-time access to the icons showing on the townsfolk card in that Viscount's location. This is called dismissing a townsperson. 
Pay silver equal to that card's cost. Resolve the icon in the top right corner. So in this case, the player could discard a card from hand. And then remove this card from the game after gaining this icon once. Finally, the player may spend any number of the matching resource to gain one action point for each. So, from all of what we just saw, this player would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight action points. These would then be spent on the place worker's action. Gathering action points works the same way across all four actions. And so now let's look into what each of these actions does. The first action is trading. The icon for trading is the blue bag and the resource that you can supplement for an action point is silver. Trading is the main way that you'll get resources in the game as well as some other benefits. This action may only be done on the outer rim of the board and each space on the outer rim shows the specific trade that may be done there. Here for example the player can spend trading actions to gain ink wells at a rate of 2 to 1. Here the player could do the same trade for stone. Here the player spends trade actions for silver at a rate of 1 to 1. And here a player may spend 3 trade icons to destroy a townsfolk card. To do this, the player either chooses one card from hand, or the top card blindly off the draw deck, removes it from the game, and gains silver equal to that card's cost. This gives players a way to gain money and optimize their deck. Finally, at this location, at a rate of four trade action points to one, players may flip over debt or deed cards in their possession. When a player acquires a debt or deed, those will initially be worth negative two or positive one points respectively. Taking this action lets you flip over a deed to make it worth three points, or flip over a debt, making it no longer worth negative points and giving you an immediate bonus of a resource of your choice. This does not include silver. Holding a majority in flipped debts or flipped deeds may also be worth additional points at the end of the game depending on how the end is triggered. The second type of action is to construct a building and this costs either hammer icons or the stone resource. This action may only be done on the outer rim of the board. To take the action, spend a number of action points based on the type of building. Three for a workshop, five for a trading post or seven for a guild hall. Then take the building of your choice, place it onto an empty building slot adjacent to your current location. To be considered adjacent, it must be between the edge of that wedge of the board and the river. The builder then immediately gains the benefit underneath the building. When a building is placed such that one of these links has a building on either side of it, then each player who owns one of those buildings gets the benefit printed on the link. If a single player owns both ends of one link, that player gains the benefit only once. Once a building has been placed, it reveals an icon which will give you an ongoing benefit. I'll run through what all of these are later in the video. Constructed buildings will also be worth victory points based on how many of a certain type you've constructed. The third type of action is to place workers in the castle, and this requires either the fleur de lis icon or to spend gold. This action may only be taken in the inner ring of the board. To take this action, the player places a number of workers into the castle based on this table here. For example, five action points would be worth three workers. These workers must be placed in the first tier of the castle adjacent to the Viscount's current location. Then check the first tier to see if there are any wedges with three workers of the same color. If there are, advance one of those workers to the second tier and immediately claim the bonus printed. Here for example the player could gain a gold or move another first tier worker one step clockwise or anti-clockwise. Then returning to the wedge that the worker advanced from, move one of the other workers in the trio clockwise and anti-clockwise. Now check the first tier again and see if there are any new groups of three. If there are, perform the same steps advance one, and then move the others clockwise and anti-clockwise, claiming the benefit printed on the second tier. Continue doing this until there are no more trios on the bottom level. Then check the second tier. If there are any groups of three matching workers on the second tier, 
advance one to the middle, claiming the bonus, which is a resource of your choice, but this time don't split the other two workers sideways. You'll see that there are no arrows on the second tier. Next, resolve the castle leader card. The first player to advance a worker to the third tier gets to take that card, and it will stay with that player until another player has more workers in the middle. The player currently holding the card keeps it when there's a tie. Whoever has this card at game's end will score 5 points, and has an increase to the hand limit of 1 while holding it. Finally, resolve overcrowding. For any sections on tiers 1 or 2 of the castle containing 4 or more workers, the active player must bump workers out until it's down to 3. Bumped workers return to the player's supply. When a worker is bumped off the bottom tier, the owner of that worker gains 2 silver, as shown on this card, and when a worker is bumped off the second tier, that worker's owner gains a virtue and a resource of their choice. Players may choose to bump their own workers if they wish to gain these benefits. Workers are never bumped from the top tier regardless of its occupancy. Once all these steps are complete, the action is finished. The final action is to transcribe a manuscript, and this requires cleric icons or ink wells. This action may only be done on the central ring of the board. A player may only transcribe the top manuscript on the stack adjacent to the Viscount's current location. The player then spends action points equal to this number on the bottom left of the manuscript and takes the token. These are then collected alongside the player's player board. Some grant an immediate bonus, this one for example would allow you to take a deed, and others will be worth an end of game victory point bonus. Players gain points for manuscripts through set collection. Each set of manuscripts with dissimilar ribbon colours will be worth an increasing number of points at the end of the game, and being the first to claim three manuscripts in a certain ribbon colour will give you the matching cleric bonus card, which is worth three points and a permanent icon for your future actions. There is one cleric bonus available for each of the four actions in the game. After you finish taking your action, you come to the hiring phase of your turn, where you may optionally hire one new townsperson for your deck. You may only hire the top townsfolk card adjacent to your Viscount's current location. Pay the silver cost printed in the top left, immediately gain the hiring effect printed in the top right, so in this case it's to discard a card from hand, then take the card and place it into your discard pile. The next phase is to resolve a collision, and this only occurs if your Virtue and Corruption markers have met on your track. So first, let's talk a little bit about how this occurs. At the start of the game, your Corruption marker will be on the left of this track, and your Virtue marker will be on the right. As you take corrupt actions, particularly using criminals, then your Corruption marker will move towards the right. When you take virtuous actions, then your virtue marker will move towards the left. At some point, which may or may not be on your turn, those two markers will collide. And from that point forward until your next resolution step, you'll move these two markers together when you gain virtue or corruption. If you gain them simultaneously, resolve corruption first. The next time that this player resolves this phase of their turn, that player and all other players go through these steps. Firstly, any players who have built this specific workshop, check their tableaus. Any such players who have no current skulls in their tableau gain one virtue. Then, all players check their tableaus for any effects showing this icon, the player collision icon. All of these effects are resolved now. Next, the active player gains the benefit or debit on the top row based on where the collided markers are. So here, the player would gain one silver and two deeds. Finally, all other players resolve the bottom effect based on where the active player's markers are. Here, for example, any players who have at least one skull currently in their tableau would gain one corruption. If they were here, any players who currently have no skulls in their tableau would gain a deed. And in the middle, all opponents would get to rearrange their tableaus. To finish this phase, the active player resets the corruption and virtue markers to their starting positions. 
this track is a major source of deeds and debts in the game. And as you can see, whether players are being virtuous or corrupt will interplay off each other. When a corrupt player collides, that player will gain some money, but also some debts, and any virtuous players, with no corruption, will gain virtue. Virtuous players will gain a lot of deeds, not much money, and will give corrupt players extra corruption. The final phase of a player's turn is to draw back up to hand limit. By default, this is three cards. When drawing, if the player's draw pile runs out and there are still cards to be drawn, the player then shuffles the discard pile and continues drawing. Shuffling the discard pile in this way, whether it's during this phase or another, triggers a corruption check. Check your current tableau, and if you have no skulls present, gain one virtue. If there is at least one skull present, then gain one corruption. After this step is complete, play passes to the next player. Now I'm going to take you through all of the bonuses that you can get by building buildings in this game. The three guild halls, as well as this trading post we've seen before. These unlock permanent icons that can be spent on your actions. We've also seen this workshop, which gives you a way of gaining virtue if you're playing a no criminal game. This trading post gives you a bonus on movement. Once it's built, you'll be allowed to move one extra space for free per turn. Building this trading post changes the rules around dismissing townsfolk. Recall that you can dismiss the top townsfolk card from your location by paying its cost to gain its icons as a once off. Once you've unlocked this bonus, the cost is always one silver, regardless of what's printed on the card. Building this workshop allows you to take a discard action whenever you hire a new worker, letting you cycle through your deck more quickly. And building this workshop increases your hand limit by one. At the very start of the game, you will not have any cards in your tableau, but there are some pre-printed icons on the board that you can use until they're covered up. As such, on your first turn, you could play this and have four trade icons. This would slide to here on your second turn, and you could play that to get six trade icons. And then on your third turn, these would slide to cover all of the pre-printed icons before you played your third card. At some locations on the main board, you may find that either the townsfolk cards or the manuscripts run out. When a manuscript stack runs out, you can still take the cleric action here, you won't get to take a manuscript, but you do get this immediate bonus. When the townsfolk stack runs out, you can no longer hire townsfolk from this location, but you can still pay this cost to dismiss the printed townsfolk, gaining these icons and that bonus. In certain situations, you may start your turn with no cards in hand at all. When this happens, after resolving your discard, you simply draw the top townsfolk card blindly and resolve that as if it were the one you played. In even more specific situations, you may be down to a deck of only three cards. And when that happens, you discard, resolving the drop-off effect, shuffle, resolving the shuffle effect, and then play that single card back into the left slot of your tableau. You may never take a destroy action to go below three total cards. Finally, it is possible, for example through this linking bonus, to start resolving a chain of castle movements on another player's turn. In situations like this, the inactive player plays first, fully resolving castle actions, before play passes back to the active player to take that same bonus. The end of the game can be triggered in one of two ways. Either by the poverty card being revealed from players taking too many debts, or by the Prosperity card being revealed by players taking a lot of deeds. Once this has happened, finish playing the current round and then play one more round so all players have had the same number of turns. Debts or deeds may still be taken by taking from below that card, and it's possible for both the Prosperity and the Poverty cards to be revealed in the same game if they both trigger at almost the same time. Once the final round is over, proceed to end of game scoring. Players score points in the following areas. Groups of three buildings score points based on how many of that group was constructed. So 15 for building all three trading posts, and six for building one guild hall, and two for one workshop. 
sets of manuscripts with dissimilar ribbons score points based on this track here. So this set of four is worth 15, this set of two is worth three, and this solo is worth nothing. Any cleric bonus cards which were gained from manuscripts score three. Then also score any manuscripts with an end game bonus. This one, for example, is one point for every hammer icon, for which you would count up all the hammer icons in your deck, as well as on any buildings and cleric bonuses you've unlocked. Score points for each of your deeds, based on whether you've flipped it or not flipped it, and lose two points for any unflipped debts. Then resolve workers in the castle. If you have the castle leader card, you gain five points, and score one point for each of your workers on tier one, two points for each worker on tier two, and three points for each worker on tier three. Here, the red player has 17 points in workers. Finally, depending on whether the prosperity or the poverty card or both were revealed, players will total up their flipped deeds and their flipped debts and score majorities. If prosperity was revealed, then players will be rewarded for flipping debts. Whoever has flipped the most debts scores 12 points, second most scores 8, and third most scores 4. If the poverty card is revealed, players are rewarded for their flipped deeds. Once again, 12 for the most, 8 for second most, and 4 for third. In the event of a tie for one of the positions, the points are summed and divided between the players. So for deeds, these players would each get 10. Players must have flipped at least one of the appropriate type to score, so neither of these players would be eligible for third most debts. And in the two player game, the eight point second place is not available, meaning players can either get 12 for first, four for second, or nothing for having nothing of the matching type. After adding up all of these points, the player with the highest score wins. The game also comes with a solo mode. You'll use the solo side of the player board to represent your auto opponent who will focus on one of the specific areas. Then this deck of cards will determine how your opponent takes actions. We won't take you through the full rules for this here, we'll leave you to read it from the rulebook. And that's how to play Viscounts of the West Kingdom. We hope that you enjoy the video and we hope that you enjoy playing. If you'd like to see the game in action to get a flavour for how it flows, we have a one round playthrough video and you can check that out by clicking on the link in the description below. Also at the time of filming, Viscounts of the West Kingdom is about to be launched on Kickstarter and so we'll put a link to that Kickstarter page also in the description below when it's live so you can check it out there. If you enjoy this video, please help us by hitting the like button. Subscribe to us. You can also hit the meeple in the corner to do so and hit the bell icon so you'll be one of the first to know when we have new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for board game photos and reviews. And finally, if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please write them in the comment section below. Until next time!